Hi, everyone. Uh, thank, thank you for joining our webinar here. Uh, I just want to make sure we have audio. So Dr. Shilkin, can you hear me? Yeah. OK, perfect. Um, so as I said, thank you. Thank you for joining at this busy time. We really appreciate it. This is a pretty strong turnout for, uh, for a time like this. So I'll start with a quick introduction. I'm Niran Gandra. I head up the commercial team at Cedar. Um, so I joined Cedar super early on as part of the founding team. Um, I, by background, I'm actually an internal medicine doc. I used to be an intensive care hospitalist for a few years uh, before I decided I wanted to get into more of the business side of healthcare, where I was a consultant for a few years and then came over to be part of Cedar's founding team. Um, so today, we're actually going to be topic, talking about the topic of the moment here, uh, which is COVID-19. So we're going to be talking about how hospitals can be prepared, what the economic impact will be like, um, and the current state of preparedness. And at Cedar, as you know, we're really focused on the patient financial experience, so really taking patients through their journey of you know, how they would deal with their payments to hospitals and physician groups. So that's what we're really focused on. But just like any other healthcare company, we've been impacted by COVID at a certain level. But our clients who we work with, especially the finance departments of hospitals, uh, have been significantly impacted. And that's what we wanted to talk about. And with me, I actually have uh, Dr. David Shulkin, who is uh, an advisor to Cedar and uh, was the ninth secretary of Veterans Affairs. So he was the former president and CEO of Beth Israel Medical Center. Uh, he's held a whole bunch of other leadership roles, uh, including president of Morristown Medical Center uh, and vice president of the Atlantic Health System Accountable Care Organization. He's also an internal medicine doc who still practices every day, unlike me. Um, and so given Dr. Shulkin's long history as a hospital executive and public servant, uh, we are honored to have him here today with us to talk about this topic. Um, and with that, I think the outline for kind of the general topics that I'm going to go through are, we'll just talk about the kind of the status of the coronavirus crisis at a high level for the first few minutes. And then we'll jump into uh, the actual meat of the topic, which is how hospitals can be best prepared and what the current state looks like, and then talk about some of the financial implications. So with that said, um, we will jump right into it, right? So, um, so Dr. Shulkin, uh, the coronavirus crisis is almost or is impacting almost everyone in in a way that we probably never imagined something like this would happen. Um, can you start maybe by giving us some perspective on what we're seeing and how long this current state might last of you know working from home and all of the other other disruptions that are happening uh, nationwide? Well, first of all, thank you, and, and uh, I welcome all the participants. I think we're all trying to understand what's happening now. It's almost unimaginable that, you know, a few short weeks ago, none of us would have thought that we'd all be in this situation, but we're all going through this together. Uh, and it's important to understand that this is really historic. Uh, for almost all of us, we've never really been through a pandemic like this. Pandemics generally, are life-changing. They change the economic uh, parts of society in ways that will be lasting forever. They change the sociologic way that we as a society perform. They clearly change the way that healthcare is practiced. And so what we're seeing now, which is really still a story whose ending is not written, is going to be something that will impact us for the rest of our lives. Um, Throughout history, there have always been pandemics, um, usually about three a year. And there's a funny thing about pandemics that people talk about that they generally can skip a generation. And so for many people, particularly younger people, uh, this is really new. There were pandemics around 2009-10 with the H1N1 and the SARS and MERS, but they didn't impact us, obviously, in the way that we're seeing now. We're going to talk a little bit about why that's the, why that's the case. But you know, just thinking about this historically, we are in a society right now with 24 hour news cycles and social media and the attention span of most of us and most of America is very short. So we keep on wondering, well, you know, when is this gonna be over? When is it gonna change? And just to give you a historical perspective, the bubonic plague that many of you remember from history books lasted six years. 
the last major plague that hit this country in 1918, it was actually a worldwide pandemic, but, but up to 50 million people died in that. Some say maybe even more closer to 100 million people died across the world. That plague in 1918 lasted three years and it would go away for a little period of time. People would think it was over and then it would come back. And that's why you keep hearing about that as a potential possibility with COVID going away and then coming back with a vengeance, uh, because that's what the experience was like in 1918. So most of us are not hoping for a six year bubonic plague or a three year influenza uh, uh, pandemic. Most of us are hoping this is gonna be over much sooner. And we're hearing about these peaks that may happen in a couple of weeks and then you know, beginning to, to slow down give you a sense, the way that scientists who study viruses think about this and when a virus will end and how we can predict that, it's actually a number that they track called a RO, R-O, or reproduction number. And right now people are saying that the COVID virus has a RO of about 2.5. For a virus to begin to start ending its pandemic influence, the RO has to turn negative. That means that there's actually less people being infected than when the virus is out there in the community. So what you're gonna be looking for and what scientists are looking for is that row to come down from about a 2.5 all the way to negative before we can really have confidence that this thing is, is getting better. Now, um, as I mentioned, this is impactful for all of us. Um, and in fact, some people are calling the people living through this now for the first time, Generation C or you know Generation COVID. And so it's important to have an understanding of what the coronavirus is. The coronavirus is actually named for its image when you look under the microscope. It actually looks like a crown on a king's head with these pointy spikes coming out of it. Many of you have seen this picture. Those spikes are proteins. Those proteins actually penetrate into other cells, human cells now, and that's what makes it so contagious and so replicable because it can enter into those cells. We're going to talk just a little bit about that. Um, but it's an entire family of viruses. Many of you know coronaviruses are SARS and MERS and other uh, you know, very infectious viruses, but it's also the common cold. It's literally an entire family. Uh, but what makes this different, this is a novel virus, which means we've, as humans, have never seen it before. And that's what makes it so contagious. Like all coronaviruses, they are spread uh, by animals. So this was originally thought to come from the bat family into another animal, and then again, thought to be spread to humans in the wet markets in China near Wuhan, which is how this was spread. Now, of course, it's a human to human transmission. And since we've never seen this before, nobody has natural antibodies to it, before this came. That's what's making it spread so contagiously. Um, and let me just finally just tell you just a little bit more about the virus. Many people think the virus is a living organism. It is not a living organism. What it is, is it's a protein that is uh, made of RNA. And it has a protective layer around that protein and MRA of fat. And that's what makes it possible uh, that fat is what attaches to nasal mucosa, bu buccal mucosa, uh, you know, in your eyes, the mucosa there, and that fat, and then the proteins uh, essentially connect into human cells, and that's how it gets spread so easily. So, so we're going to talk about that as, as something that we can do now that we understand what these viruses are and, and how they're composed uh, as ways to be able to fight this virus. So. Near, and I think I'll stop there as sort of a general introduction. Yep, that's that's super helpful uh, and definitely learn something there uh, in, in terms of how the virus is structured. Uh, you know, one thing that maybe before we jump into, you know, how hospitals can be prepared and all of that, uh, that maybe everyone who's joined the webinar is probably most curious about just in our day-to-day -day lives, what can we do to, to prevent getting the infection? Uh, and maybe can you comment a little bit more on how it's spreading and you know why it's spread so far. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let's go back to what we were just talking about. This is not living, this is that MRA protein covered by fat. And so 
the reason why the recommendation has been to be so concerned about washing your hands as one of the most important things that you can do not to spread this infection is the virus does not penetrate normal healthy skin. So unless you have open cuts or things like that, your skin is fine, but it does remain the virus on your skin as this protein. And as I said, it's covered by this layer of fat. So if you can actually break that fat off, it's a very thin layer of fat actually around the virus. If you can get rid of that fat, then the protein naturally decays and it's gone. And so the way that you get rid of fat, frankly, is soap. Soap is a detergent that uh, acts by essentially getting rid of fat. And so by washing your hands, and the effective way to wash your hands is not only the 20 seconds that we've heard about, but if you're using soap, you actually want to see the foam. You want it to foam up because that's actually the action that is breaking down the, the fat. And you want to be doing this with water that's at least 25 degrees Celsius. So it's a, it's a warm, warmish, sort of slightly almost hot water, not, not burning hot, of course. And that breaks down the fat as well. And that's actually quite effective. The other thing that's effective is anything that has an alcohol preparation in it of 65%. Now, I'm not talking about drinking that alcohol, but using it in a uh, disinfectant. Um, people are spending a lot of money on antibactericidal soaps. This is not a bacteria. So, so frankly, that isn't effective. What you want to be doing is breaking down that lipid layer and 65% alcohol or above can do that. What we do know about this virus that stays on um, objects or stays on, on stationary equipment is very important for us to know. So on cardboard, it generally is thought to last up to about 24 hours. On metal surfaces, 42 hours. On plastic, up to 72 hours. So if you're touching things that uh, are any of those materials or other things, you generally want to make sure that you're cleaning and disinfecting that or washing your hands after you've touched a doorknob, a light switch, uh, a computer or phone that's shared by other people, you want to make sure that you do that. The other important thing to know is, is that some of the ways that you normally just take care of things around the house, like taking sheets and shaking them out or blankets and shaking them out, you really don't want to do that because the virus then is lifted up into the air and can last uh, up to three days as it floats around. So you really want to stop shaking things out and you know just try to keep the air layers down as much as possible. The virus also doesn't like darkness. So anything that exposes it to light, UV light is actually quite effective. For, for those of you who are in hospitals and you're thinking about ways, how do I disinfect masks or have to reuse um, equipment? If there are UV lights available, and many hospitals have them, having them sit under UV light. But if you don't have that, just letting your clothing sit out in natural sunlight for a couple of hours uh, is also quite effective. Um, the one thing that probably many people may not like to hear is, is that if you do have long nails, you probably should be cutting them short because the virus does like to stay in dark, moist places. And behind your nail beds is a place where a virus can stay and that protein can stay. So it's one of the things that you can do um, other than good uh, hand washing is keeping your nails fairly short. So those are general things that we think about here. All right. So one thing we will know is that everyone who's attending this webinar, they will know how to wash their hands, right? And I, I think that is actually a much harder thing uh, than, you know, what it is seen to be by a lot of people. Uh, you know, just running your hands kind of under the water is not quite good enough. No. I'm just going to zoom out here for a second. Uh, if you take a global lens on this thing, you know, where do you see uh, kind of the epicenters being? Where do you see the issues are under control? Uh, who's, still, who's still having a hard time with this? Uh, I'd be curious to hear your view kind of on that level. Well, the, the uh, international experience and in looking at that is actually quite a confusing picture. And I'm not sure that we're fully going to understand why this is so different in different parts of the world uh, for a while, but it's going to be a very interesting question. I think right now what we can see is, of course, 
This started in China, in the Wuhan area. It does appear that they have peaked, that that's coming under control. And I think that that speaks to the most strictest way of adhering to uh, social isolation, quarantining, the way that they did that. Um, you know, they lasted approximately a two month, two and a half month period of time before they've started to now begin to start rebuilding towards relaxing those standards. So I think that's held out as one aspect of the international experience. The other Asian experience that I think we should really be learning from is what happened in South Korea and somewhat in Japan. But in South Korea, you have to remember, their first case of coronavirus in their country was reported on the exact same day that the first case was reported in the United States. So you have two examples here. What South Korea did was they went out with extensive and wide diagnostic testing right away. They found where the pockets of the infection were and they isolated the pockets of those infections with quarantining. And their experience has been pretty dramatic in reducing and controlling and containing the number of infections with mortality rates of less than 1%, around 0.79%. The United States, as you know, now has become the number one place in the world with infections, uh, no other numbers like ours. And as you see, epicenters that continue to replicate and numbers that continue to grow for a while. We, of course, were not prepared on the diagnostic testing side, had no ability. In fact, I will still tell you that many, many people that I know who have clear symptoms of coronavirus today are still unable to get tested. There are centers like nursing homes not able to get tests, although residents are symptomatic. So we still, while we've made a lot of progress on getting testing out, the new Abbott test, of course, just being released in the last couple of days, uh, but it is still not widespread. We still are operating without the full information and can't use the South Korean strategy. The European experience has been probably the most perplexing. Uh, they still are seeing increases in cases. Um, their uh, social distancing, like the United States, has not yet shown to be completely effective in, in it looks like there may be some slowing, but it has not stopped the rise in cases. But most concerning is the mortality rate in Italy is now around 11%, which is just incredible. Spain, which is uh, you know, not far behind Italy, is in the eight to 9% mortality rate. Still in the United States, we're reporting mortality rates of about one and a half percent. So uh, the Chinese experience was around 3.4%. You would think maybe this is a different mutant uh, mutation or a different genetic variant in terms of its virulence as a virus, but it's not. Uh, the work so far has shown that this virus does not mutate, which is important, frankly, for it's good news for the development of the vaccine. That means that if one is developed, that it probably will last a while. But uh, it's very hard to understand the differences in how this is being impacted in terms of hospitalization rates, containment rates, and uh, mortality rates. But I think the experience of showing that if you uh, do extensive diagnostic testing and then very strict quarantining and distancing that probably is our best insight into what will be most effective. Got it. That that makes sense. I I do agree with you that I think it's been really perplexing why even neighboring countries have such a different experience with it. Why Italy and Germany have kind of radically different trajectories in what's yeah. happening. Um, you know, one thing that I get asked about a lot, and you know, especially with my old intensive care colleagues, I have a lot of you know, coworkers who's obviously stuck in intensive care medicine, and I talk to them all the time about this, is how do you treat this thing, right? Is there anything that is actually working on the ground? And, you know, there have been tons of rumors about medications at work. I think uh, Donald Trump tweeted about hydroxychloroquine uh, and chloroquine. There's also been uh, Kaletra and convalescent plasma and kind of all these different options. Uh, there's also kind of the old school things, right? vitamin C, taking zinc. Uh, have you, you know, any truth to any of this in your view? Uh, and can we place a hope in any of these types of solutions? Or do you think we're really waiting for a vaccine at the end of the day? 
Well, um, there are right now about 70 different drugs under various clinical trials or study groups. Uh, in terms of vaccines, there are 55 vaccine projects going on right now. Um, the vaccine clearly, if you take a look at viruses that we've been through that we have really controlled, whether it's measles, polio, uh, even some types of influenza, certainly SARS, uh, it has been through vaccine control. So I think that's the long-term thinking. There are several types of vaccines. The one that I think people are most encouraged about are the mRNA vaccines, which function a little bit differently, but they will get us to a vaccine solution the quickest in that the MRA directly stimulates an immuno, uh, an immuno uh, stimulant response, a antigen is directly formed, and that allows a quicker access to development of a effective vaccine. That's the one that Moderna, which is the company that first announced that they're working on this and why people are encouraged by a late 2021, maybe early 22 date uh, for commercialization and production. Uh, technically, it's not a very complex vaccine to produce, but it is the safety trials that will still take that time. In the meantime, there are 70 drugs that are under clinical trial development. Uh, the United States has come on fast. When I first looked at this uh, through the clinical trial networks throughout the uh, world, there were uh, over 100 clinical trials but uh, only eight in the United States. The vast majority were Chinese trials, uh, but now the United States has really been catching up by expanding uh, the clinical trial use and development. Um, the reason why people, including the president, were probably most excited about Plaquenil or, or hydroxychloroquine and the azithromycin combination is because those are drugs that are readily available. They are commercially being produced, um, they are, uh, most hospitals can have access to them and we understand their safety profile. Uh, the original study in France showed that there was some potential hope with hydroxychloroquine, plaquenil, and azithromycin. A subsequent study from China of 30 patients showed that there was not an impact. There was not an effect on the plaquenil uh, group. In fact, the Plaquenil group actually performed worse than the placebo group. So we're clearly operating with out good data. These numbers of these case reports from France and China are very small. We don't know. I think people are using this uh, because it probably, when you have a very sick patient, it's being used essentially on a compassionate use basis. Um, although, you know, it certainly has FDA um, you know, willingness to put aside the traditional labels to use it as an off-label use. Uh, I do not think that this uh, destroys the virus. I think that Plaquenil is probably working through decreasing the inflammatory response. And azithromycin may also work in the same way, but it said that up to 30, 40% of people in hospitals who have uh, the COVID-19 virus also have a co-infection, often a bacterial virus, as we see viral and bacterial pneumonias often together. So maybe the azithromycin could be helpful in that, in that way as well. Uh, I think the most likely drug right now, I don't have a crystal ball into all the things that are being developed, is remdesivir, which is the drug that is in uh, phase three clinical trial, so it's not fully approved. Uh, but it is developed by Gilead for the Ebola crisis. So it's a viral and antiviral. And it does look to me like, again, anecdotally, not with scientific clinical trial data being reported yet, that those who have had access to it have done fairly well. So I'm personally most helpful for that. That could be released by the FDA out of the final clinical trials as early as the end of April. I know they're working on that as soon as possible. So we should watch that and then see how quickly that could be developed. Uh, Regeneron and other companies are working on different mechanisms of action that I think are also potentially encouraging, but again, not enough data to know that yet. Got it. Uh, and you know, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit here to talk about you know, the US healthcare response. 
And I think one of the things that we're doing is social distancing. Obviously, I think a lot of us are working from home. I think both of us are doing this webinar from our homes. Um, but the other thing that's come up a lot is this question of testing. You know, how much testing should we have? Should we be testing asymptomatic patients? Um, where do you fall on that? What, what do you think is the correct approach? Should we be testing everybody? Should we be testing asymptomatic people? Um, do you think it's too late for testing to have an effect in terms of kind of slowing down the crisis in and of itself? Uh, well, you know, as I've sort of inferred before, I think in retrospect, the big, big mistake the United States will have made is, is the stumble that we had on not being ready for diagnostic testing. And there's going to be a story there. I don't know what it will be about what that mistake was. But clearly, if South Korea was able to launch 250,000 tests immediately, and we were weeks and weeks of not having any testing available, that was a mistake. But, um, but at this point right now, we need to get more testing out there. I am an advocate for doing broad testing, uh, particularly not only to know how to uh, you know, stop um, the spread from happening in areas that are uh, experiencing high levels of infection, but even for those areas that aren't. And in knowing when it's going to be okay to start to relax some of these uh, social distancing standards and to start returning back to normal life. I think the economic consequences of what we're going through are going to be severe and long, long lasting. And we know that from past pandemics, the impact that this can have. We know it from the depression. I remember my grandparents, uh, even though I was a kid, you know, growing up, um, all they did was talk about what things were like in the depression. This is going to have a long lasting impact. So knowing when we can relax those standards and safely come back, and I think the standard that uh, seems reasonable for knowing when to relax is when the virus is beginning to decline, that row number that's negative, uh, for about 14 days. In other words, when when you see the decline in the community for 14 days, which is the outer limits of when that incubation period can happen, that's when it's clearly going to be safe that we can start going and looking to start having some sense of normalcy again. The only way that you know that is through testing because this virus, as we all know, is spread by asymptomatic people. And so falsely thinking that you can go back and avoid some of the things that are so hard for so many of us right now, I think is gonna be a mistake unless we have that wide testing. Now, the testing that's being used up to date is a PCR test. That's the one where you have to uh, be a pretty sophisticated laboratory to use. Uh, we are now seeing point-of-care testing and antibody testing. Those are two separate things, but the point-of-care testing being released now that supposedly results five to 15 minutes could be done in an office setting so that that could be widespread and done the way that you do, you know, pregnancy testing, you know, in an office uh, and get an immediate result. Uh, but the antibody testing is also coming on the line, and that is going to be important to see what type of immunity people develop. And that's actually one of the uh, treatments that we didn't talk about that I failed to mention, the convalescent plasma. That is plasma from people, blood products from people who have recovered from the infection, who have developed the antibody, who can then potentially have protective immunity and help fight infections for those who are sick. And now that we're seeing people recovering and donating their blood, I think that that's a very encouraging uh, method of treatment that we've shown have been effective in other viral diseases. And again, I'm hopeful that it will be effective here in the COVID infections. Got it. And so we, you know, obviously for this webinar, I think we have a lot of hospital leaders and hospital executives on the webinar. Uh, I'm curious to hear from you, you know, what you think hospitals should be doing to prepare for the potential wave of COVID patients that's coming at them. I think New York is already there, but the, you know, for the rest of the country, that the wave might not have arrived yet. Yeah. Um, so how do you see, you know, what hospitals should be doing? How should they be thinking about, you know, supplies and personnel and all of that? Well, uh, first of all, when I look around the country, I think our hospital leaders are doing a miraculous job. They're doing amazing things, uh, you know, not asking uh, and making 
excuses for why they can't do things. They're just getting it done. And so creating surge capacity for, um, you know, essentially increasing your capacity in your hospital by 50%, your ICU capacity often by 20 or 30%, converting uh, ambulatory surgery centers into places where ventilators could be operating rooms, changing your uh, common areas like auditoriums or cafeterias into places where patients who uh, are, you know, can be moved. CMS, of course, just relaxing their standards so that uh, hospitals can now move non-COVID patients to sites like what I'm talking about. Uh, I think our hospital leaders are doing a pretty good job at that. In fact, a miraculous job. But, um, but you know, the job of a hospital leader is to plan for the worst case scenario and hope for the best. And um, not to be taking this seriously, not to be planning for this happening uh, um, relatively quickly, I think would be a mistake, even if there is not a lot of COVID right now in your community. And just watch what happened in the New York area, how quickly that happened, watch how quickly it's happening in other parts of the country. So uh, better to get ahead of it, better to plan, and then better to have said, you know, we didn't need all that. But uh, the most valuable resource that you're going to have is staffing. Um, this is a respiratory condition where people who are sick need ventilatory support. So you have relatively limited amounts of professionals who have experience in that. You have limited respiratory therapists, anesthesiologists, critical care physicians, uh, and nursing and ICUs. So uh, taking care of your staff and working with them as best you can is super important. What we know from past pandemics is that up to 50% of staff during the height of a pandemic will not be at work due to absenteeism. Either they themselves are sick, uh, they're caring for people at home with no one else to care for them, or frankly, they're just scared to come into work. And so you're seeing this already in New York City. You have 5,000 New York policemen who are, who are infected. You have first responders driving the ambulances and the fire departments who are infected. In the international experience in Spain and in Italy, 14% of all infections are healthcare workers. And so we've already seen, unfortunately, some healthcare workers pass away due to COVID. So uh, making sure they have the proper tools and equipment, the protective equipment, making sure they're supported and cared for and safe for they themselves and their family, I think is the primary job of hospital leadership right now. You know, one thing that's come up is uh, this, this thing that I probably never experienced when I was you know, doing clinical medicine full time is this idea that personal protective equipment, uh, you know, there's a shortage of that. Uh, I think it makes a little more sense why there's a shortage of ventilators since they're big complex pieces of equipment. What's your view on the shortage of personal protective equipment? And do you think uh, hospitals are starting to address that or what should hospitals be doing about this? Well, I think when it came to PPE, I think that um, it was the perfect storm. First of all, many hospitals for efficiency reasons went to just-in-time inventory. Secondly, most of this equipment is, uh, you know, especially the cheaper products like the masks and the gloves and the gowns are produced in China. And when this hit in China, it was right at the beginning of the Chinese New Year's where the factories were shutting down and, and a planned uh, reduction in industrial capacity. This hit and then they didn't open up. And in addition, they had their own internal needs for this. So, so much of the supply chain was disrupted because of that. You're now beginning to see some of that get back online and there should be some help with that. Uh, but, um, you know, when you have uh, you know, production and supply that is reduced at the time that demand is going through the roof worldwide, uh, you're gonna see these types of shortages. And so what can you do about it? I think we're seeing the ingenuity in healthcare. We're seeing uh, masks being reused and protective equipment being reused. And we've talked about ways of disinfecting it. There are steam, methodologies, an article in JAMA now about the cloud of steam to be able to disinfect this equipment to reuse it. But um, we're also seeing, unfortunately, at the time of crisis, we're seeing people trying to take advantage of this. We're seeing hoarders and all of your hospital supply chain people and finance people 
have seen these people contact them saying that they have supplies of masks and equipment and then raising the prices to ridiculous amounts. And I hope that those people are found and prosecuted for what they're doing because uh, while we've seen this in every crisis, people taking advantage of other people, I think that it's outrageous and there's no place for that. So um, right now we're beginning to see some opening up of the supply chains and uh, not quick enough, of course, but um, I think people are managing the best they can. Got it. And, you know, with Cedar, we work a very closely with the revenue cycle side of hospitals, obviously, especially on the patient side, right? We're trying to improve the patient experience. We're trying to improve revenue cycle metrics on that side. Um, you know, when you look at the financial impact for hospitals with this COVID-19 crisis, uh, I'm curious, you know, how you're looking at this. And maybe I'll start with kind of a, one, one topic of this is a lot of health systems are postponing elective procedures. Uh, how do you think this will impact the revenue stream for, you know, these health systems? Has, have you seen any modeling about this? And do you think any of the stimulus funding or uh, any of the government interventions are going to help kind of uh, help ease this pain? Yeah, this is this is a big issue, um, and it can and it, and it impacts every hospital, health system, healthcare provider, whether you're home health, ambulatory, physician practices, differently. So clearly, I think most of the finance leaders who are on this webinar have already begun this initiative, which is they're going to have to reforecast their budgets. They're going to have to do projections that make assumptions about how long this lasts. Uh, but look at it from the impact on what it does in terms of cash flow and, and overall uh, margin and impact on capital projects as well. But in general, uh, almost all hospitals across the country have delayed elective surgeries, by the way, appropriately. Uh, those tend to be, as we all know, some of the more profitable cases. Many hospitals are seeing revenue reductions of up to 50%. And that means when they look at not only the elective cases, but they look at the reduction in ancillary services, the reduction of their ambulatory visits, which for many hospitals are now 60, 65% of their revenue, uh, they are looking at 50% reductions, which is pretty, pretty significant. Uh, now, there are some exceptions to that. I've seen a hospital system in the Midwest that's you know at about 86% of what their normal revenue is. So, I mean, there's variation depending upon uh, what's happening in that community. Um, but um, the, the impact is broader than that. Uh, at the same time, supply costs, as we just talked about, are rising. Staffing costs, because of the absenteeism and the need to have more staff on hand to be prepared, are dramatically increased. Some places have to rely upon temporary staffing agencies that are expensive. Other places are paying overtime for staff that can put in extra hours. So that raises it. And then you have to think about the non-operating income. For many systems, operating margins in not-for-profit organizations have generally been one to 3%, but non-operating revenue has been quite uh, helpful in supplementing their needs because the market has done fairly well over the past couple of years up until this recent crisis. I think most finance people are now looking at uh, zero contributions from their non-operating revenue unless they've been very conservative in their investments. So a lot is going to change. Um, the stimulus bill, uh, I think, is, is helpful. I think that of the 2.2 trillion, 127 billion is for healthcare. 100 billion of that is for hospitals. Now, uh, there's lots of stipulations in there. I think as many of your clients know, that really is for not-for-profit hospitals. So if you're on the for-profit side, you're not going to see much of that stimulus bill, and therefore you're gonna be struggling with this without that additional help. On the not-for-profit side, you can expect to see uh, some help by elimination, at least initially, of the 2% sequestration for Medicare. That's, uh, you know, people did not have that built into their 2020 budget, so I think that's helpful you will see a reduction of the dish payments. That's about 8 billion, 4 billion in this year and some extended into fiscal year 2021. You will see a 20% increase on your per case costs for COVID coded infections. So it's very important that 
every infection be coded appropriately, extra costs be identified. Uh, FEMA has been given a fair amount of additional money, so I do believe money will be available for grants, for emergency preparedness and extraordinary costs, so keeping track with very good cost accounting of these, <coughs> excuse me, of these extra costs, I think is going to be very, very important as well. But, um, and then you have to look at the payer side. As, as we've seen, payers have eliminated, uh, in many cases, um, the co-payments and the cost shares for COVID-related infections, the costs associated with testing and the whole experience around testing are things that can now be passed on to payers and potentially passed on to CMS. We think this is going to involve Medicare Advantage plans as well. So there are many financial considerations of this, clearly some positives, but overall, my estimate uh, in terms of the cost uh, impact is, is that this will reimburse hospitals and uh, on, on the uh, plus side back about 30% of their total revenue loss and total costs. So I think that systems, again, it will vary depending upon the specifics, but really should be looking at um, reduction in contributions and overall revenue of about two thirds as long as this crisis continues to last. You know, uh, how do you see the, how do you see telehealth within this? Because a lot of, uh, a lot of visits are being replaced by telehealth visits and CMS said they've reimbursed them. Do you see that being a long-term change where, you know, things that are going to telehealth now, they stay in telehealth or do you see that as a short-term, you know, this is what we're doing for the COVID crisis, but it's back to business as usual afterwards? Yeah, I think the telehealth story, again, is very variable by health system. How prepared they were for this, how open both their staff and their patient populations are to it. You've clearly seen some dramatic successes. Uh, Cleveland Clinic, which generally does about 3,400 televisits um, a month, will finish March at about 600,000 telehealth visits. So, it, it, you know, that's an example of a system, and Kaiser's another system that had a good infrastructure ready to open it up and really has done that quite effectively. Uh, but many telehealth providers um, or many systems that are newer to telehealth are struggling to figure out ways to do this. Uh, and so they're seeing incremental volumes. For those that are seeing uh, greater telehealth capacity, you're seeing about 75% of those telehealth visits being for COVID related assessments and diagnoses. So, so it is not a replacement for uh, most of their specialty care activities, you know, generally tends to be used in more urgent situations. In terms of how long lasting this is, I do believe that it is going to be very hard to put the genie back into the bottle after this is over. CMS has waived most of the 1135 regulations that have been the barriers to widespread dissemination of telehealth, both from a reimbursement strategy as, a re as well as regulatory strategies. Uh, they have announced them as temporary, as if they will go back. Uh, I don't think that is going to be easy to do. It may happen, but I think now that people have seen that this never was a technological issue or even a, a demand issue, this was always a regulatory and reimbursement issue that prevented telehealth from moving quicker, uh, that people will make the argument, not only was this a very successful experiment in showing why this was important, but if we're gonna be prepared for the next pandemic, the next time that something like this happens, whether it's a man-made emergency or whether it's another infectious agent, uh, telehealth is going to be an important part of how we respond to those types of national emergencies. And of course, the Department of Defense and the Department of Veteran Affairs has long been um, using this technology at the Department of Veteran Affairs, when I was secretary, I worked extremely hard to go through all these regulations and waivers and got them done. And VA last year served uh, about uh, 9 million telehealth visits. So um, pretty, pretty effective use of it and reaching people in all parts of the country, particularly rural areas, 
with expertise that they just wouldn't have in those areas um, if you act more like a national system. So, so, so I think that this is one of those long lasting changes that we're gonna see. I just want to remind the audience, by the way, so we only have 10 minutes left, but you know, if you want to submit a question or two, we can try to get to them. Um, but you know, with that said, you know, one topic I wanted to get to, which is you know, very near and dear close to CEDAR, is this idea of you know, how do you communicate with patients about, about bills in this time, right? So uh, you know, how do you view what hospitals need to do here in terms of balancing being sensitive to what's happening uh, versus also, you know, trying to get paid for their services. Uh, how do you think hospitals and health systems should be approaching patients on this topic? Yeah, we haven't, we haven't spent a lot of time on this webinar talking about the impact of this, the sort of unintended consequences of the impact on people's lives who have lost their jobs or who have been furloughed or um, you know, simply uh, separated from uh, their normal social interaction. And what we do know, as I mentioned earlier from past pandemics, is that um, people's uh, level of anxiety, depression, behavioral health issues are dramatically increased during this period of time. In fact, when you look years later after past pandemics, up to 30% of the population has experienced and continues to experience symptoms of post-traumatic stress. So I think that we as healthcare providers need to be very sensitive to the disruption and the impact this has had on people's lives. If you think about it just from an economic point of view, we're gonna see people who have had to make difficult choices, not being able to have the money to buy their medication. Some people whose health insurance will have lapsed because they're no longer employed or because they themselves were no longer able to pay their premiums. And so we're gonna see the uh, cost of to people, to patients, their cost shares go up in many cases and their financial responsibility for those payments go up. And so I think that health systems are going to have to work with their patients in a way that uh, recognizes how disruptive this has been, create more payment plans. Some of the things that CEDAR does quite effectively using behavioral economics and strategies to see what people feel comfortable and can afford to pay to be able to address those balances. But I think that hospitals would be making a mistake if they uh, didn't really look at this issue and treat their communities and the people that they've served uh, with a basic understanding of how impactful and disruptive this has been to everybody. And so we all are in this together. We're gonna to have to get out of this together and working to do individual plans with patients, I think is gonna be more important than ever. That, that makes sense. And I think that's been our approach at CEDAR is really to focus on giving patients more options, education, uh, and you know, doing things like extending the billing cycle, things like that that demonstrate that you know, we understand, the, understand what patients are going through. Um, you know, when you look at the big picture, how do you view the changes that are going to come about in both our public sector and the private sector as, you know, focusing on healthcare, but as a result of this COVID crisis? Do you think there's going to be, you know, large scale structural change that's going to happen from this? I do. I think that, I think, as I said, pandemics have a way of changing the world. Um, and this Generation C that I talked about, the younger generation, I think is going to be particularly impacted by this. And we already saw our younger generation taking on issues that impact everybody like climate change much more seriously than I think many people in later generations because this is their world that they're gonna be inheriting. And so uh, when you think about what the lessons are that will come out of this, it really is a interconnectedness among people and the responsibility for the shared environment that we have. So nobody, whether you're rich or poor, uh, including some of the you know, royalty in Britain and the prime minister's wife in Canada and Chris Cuomo from CNN, you know, uh, they're, you know, the rich and powerful aren't protected from viruses and they're not protected from changes to the climate and they're not protected from these global 
socioeconomic changes as well. So I think the lessons here are going to be a number. Number number one is uh, Americans, rightly so, got very cynical of government, tired of the games in Washington that politicians play. Uh, I myself experienced that and was disgusted by the partisan politics in Washington and how difficult it was to get real work done and the mission of what government is. Government is about providing safety for its citizens. Most people think about that as a defense. You know, we need to protect ourselves with the military, which of course is true. But when you think about health issues, that's also a responsibility. And so I think it's gonna reset people's expectations and frankly respect for what people in government do and why it's important to have competent people who know what they're doing during times of crisis, who are experienced and not a politician who likes to play politics. Uh, so I think that's number one. Secondly, I think we need to rethink our healthcare system. We clearly, it's obvious how fragmented we are, how we don't have ways of sharing resources between each other, how uh, those that are part of systems and integrated are frankly faring better than those that are out there for, by, by themselves. So we need to rethink our whole system of delivering care and our response to public health crises and how we can do this better in the future. And I think there are many lessons that are coming out of that. And I think this will have a whole new uh, level of interest and energy from younger people who will want to go into making this system work better from a public health and population health point of view. I also think, and I hope, maybe this is the hopeful part, that people will learn to start treating each other better with respect uh, and caring for one another and recognizing how interconnected we are. Um, to me and to many people, the world, and I'm talking about the United States in particular, was just getting uh, relatively mean, attacking each other, um, you know, accusational, uh, separating people by the groups that they're in, whether they're cultural or religious. We saw rises in anti-Semitism. We saw, you know, nasty attacks on people whose origins weren't here and, um, you know, who didn't have legal status in this country. And I really think um, this should bring us much closer together and begin to act with more humanity and caring for one another. So, so, so in many ways, uh, I hope this is a big reset for both policymakers as well as people who are experiencing this so we can come out of this thinking about the world differently. Yep, and that, that may be the one silver lining of all of this crisis, right? I think potentially, you know, in the long term, we come out of this better society, better people uh, out of it. Uh, so with that said, I think that's actually a great note to wrap things up. Uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Shulkin, for the time. This is much appreciated and I think very timely for everyone that joined. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined. Uh, please feel free to reach out if you have any questions uh, afterwards that you think of. We're happy to talk about them more. Uh, but you know, I just want to thank everyone for joining and thank you, Dr. Shulkin, for the time. Thank you, Niram. Thanks.